All right. Um, okay. So, hi everyone. Um, welcome to another one of APSA's interactive sessions of the 2022-2023 academic year. We are pleased to host tonight's session with current trainees to answer questions specifically about secondary applications and this phase of the application cycle. And just as a reminder, tonight's webinar is a part of our ongoing supporting applicant webinar series, and we encourage all of you in attendance tonight to be on the lookout for the registration for our next session, which will be on August 25th. Uh, so I'd now like to have our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves, um, including your current institutions, um, your year in the program, and your research and clinical interests. Um, and to be efficient, I'll, I'll call on you by name. So let's start with Megan. Um, thanks, Jenny. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Megan. Um, I am a rising M1, so just starting my MD PhD at the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University MSTP. Um, my research interests are in hearing, hearing loss, auditory neuroscience, and like how our brain responds to hearing loss. Um, and you can probably guess my clinical interests are in like ENT and otolaryngology. So yeah, um, I really benefited from these uh, panels when I was applying. So Happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thanks, Megan. Uh, let's go to Jessica. Hey, all. I'm Jessica. I'm at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Uh, just became an M2, <laughs> finding it hard to accept that, but we move on. Um, I'm interested in brain injury, stroke, also sleep science. Um, I'm a non-traditional student, so I've got a lot of um, sort of disparate background, um, so lots of interest, um, but at the moment thinking neuro, um, but it's a long road, so things can change. Thanks, Jessica and Sal. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I am a G4 M3. So I did all four years of my PhD and I just restarted my uh, M3 year in June. So I'm kind of on the further end of the spectrum. Uh, my clinical research stuff. So my PhD was in CPR and ways that we can improve it uh, using some kind of defibrillator technology. Uh, and so my clinical interests are um, between emergency medicine and critical care, like ICU stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, happy to answer questions about kind of what life looks like further on down the road. Awesome. Thanks, Sal. And thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, we're grateful you took the time out of your day to come virtually to our meeting and provide your wisdom and pearls to folks thinking about the dual degree application process. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Jenny Jin, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I am also an incoming second year MD PhD student at Columbia University. And in the chat box, moderating uh, will be Anna Kolstad, and our volunteer live tweeting uh, will be Eli Wisdom. Um, and I believe, Anna, if you want to also like share your email in the chat. Um, that is also an avenue through which people can submit questions. Um, and for those of you who will have to step away or miss any part of the, the webinar, um, we will have it recorded and posted on the APSA website. Um, and I just want to remind you, um, as I mentioned, Anna's email and also the Q&A box um, is available for any of you to submit questions live during the session. And um, we will make sure to prioritize those. Uh, so I think that's all in terms of logistics, um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. Um, and so this first question is um, kind of a, a broad overview, uh, but if you all could kind of explain the whole process of secondary applications from start to finish, um, and also if you have any like tidbits about just the general timeline of applying to a dual degree program. Um, and let's start with Jessica. Yeah, secondary applications. After you put in a ton of work into your primary application, you sort of wipe the sweat off and then it's time for secondaries to come through. 
Um, in terms of specific timeline, forgive me, it's been a little while. Maybe Megan will be um, better positioned to answer questions about specific timelines since it was more recent. Um, I didn't apply to as many schools as people told me to apply to. I was hearing people say, apply to like 40 schools. And I applied to 13 schools. That was still more than enough secondaries. Um, I was lucky enough to have a job where I could um, work on my secondaries on evenings and weekends and not worry about it. Um, so once secondaries started coming in, um, which I feel like for me was by this time I was already getting secondaries. Apologies if that's not correct. Um, I took probably three to four weeks to get all of my secondaries out. Um, and then every school is different. I got a rejection from um, UW before I even um, sent them any secondaries. Um, and also, uh, you know, I didn't hear back from the school that I currently go to until April. Um, so it's really varied. Um, but yeah, I think the most important thing for timing is just to make sure that you are on top of things. Um, firstly, obviously it like looks good to have stuff in sooner, but also secondly, just sort of getting it off of your plate um, is really nice. And then you can just sort of focus on what you're doing right now, because what you're doing in this year, um, if it's a gap year, if it's your final year, if, you know, it's one of five, six gap years, whatever, it's still an important year. Um, so you don't want to let secondaries consume you too much. That's all I've got for timeline stuff. Sorry, it was a little bit vague. Oh, that was super helpful. Um, Megan or Sal, any, any other points of insight? Yeah, um, no, that was like pretty much the same for me. So I uh, submitted my primary application pretty soon after it opened. So um, I had done a total of three gap years, but when I was applying, it had been two. Um, so I was like, I had that time to kind of think about my application and I was like ready to go at the beginning. Um, and then I think I got, because I submitted so early, I got um, secondaries relatively early. So usually schools, I think at this point, most schools send out secondaries to like pretty much everyone who applies with the exception of a few. Um, and so I think I got my secondaries like towards like mid to end June for most schools. Some schools were a little bit later. Um, and then, yeah, I started just kind of working on them. At first I started working on them in the order that I got them. But like Jessica, I also applied, I think to like maybe 16 schools at the end, um, but I was more ambitious in the beginning. So I sent my primary application to probably like 25, um, but I didn't actually end up doing all of those secondaries and I can explain why in a second. But yeah, I think one piece of advice I would give is um, kind of make a priority list of the schools you're interested in and try to send those secondaries in sooner if you can, um, only because timing is pretty important in the process of applying. So if you think about it from the school's perspective, which most schools have rolling admissions, um, the first like applications they have on their desk they have all of their interview slots open, but then towards the end of the cycle, if they don't see your secondary until like, you know, November or something, they're gonna have fewer slots. So you could have the most amazing application, but you're just, the only thing you have against you is time, the time that you submitted it. Um, so yeah, I would say try to get those in early. Um, it's definitely hard. You have like a lot of them all at once. And um, some of them, especially for MD, PhD applications have a lot of essays. Um, so I think that if you are applying next cycle, like you're not applying currently, definitely think about some secondary questions. There's a lot of information online um, to just like start thinking about them so that when they all come in, you're not just like trying to answer these questions, you know, like off the top of your head. Um, but if you're currently applying, um, another piece of advice I would give to save time is definitely think about ways you can use bits and pieces of what you've written if for multiple prompts. Um, so yeah, that's all I'll say for now. I'm sure we can dive into that in more detail if you guys have more questions on it. Um, okay, uh, great chat, Jessica and Megan. Um, so I'm like, my route was a little bit more, I'm like a black sheep in the MD-PhD world. I 
didn't get into schools my first like uh, application cycle. So I ended up doing a post back program and the post back program, uh, I was taking the classes alongside the medical students. And then once I got into the medical school, um, I just applied straight MD. And then because I had taken these courses, um, I didn't have to retake a lot of the M1 curriculum. So I spent a lot of time in the lab because I found a lab at my school that was very similar to my undergrad lab. So I had this accelerated pathway and I ended up uh, applying to the PhD program during my M2 year. Um, so I kind of can offer a very different perspective on if you decide that MD PhD is the way that you want to go, there are multiple ways to do it. Um, and I know I don't know if all schools do it that way, but my school um, definitely has this pathway where you can actually apply to the PhD during your MD cycle. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, um, for that helpful insight. Um, OK, so uh, this, is, this has been kind of um, talked about already, but what are some of the common questions um, that are on secondaries? And specifically, for people applying dual degree, what, if, what did you notice that were asked of applicants with that specifically? Um, and let's start with Sal. Uh, so secondaries are kind of this opportunity to differentiate yourself or kind of be a little more like give some more um, like insight into as to who you are. Um, so I remember um, a couple of things that I had were like uh, hobbies and uh, experiences that stuck out. Um, meaning like uh, what was a experience that kind of reshaped your thought about a certain way or something like that. Um, and so I have always um, given advice to people that I've talked to coming into uh, Rosalind Franklin. I've always talked to them saying that they should really pick something that's about them and find something that's not necessarily medicine related because I think that uh, people try to like, they try to shoe in a medical story to prove that, you know, they have this um, passion for medicine. And I think a lot of times they end up telling a weak story because they've picked something that's just medically related. And everyone applying to medical school has a medical story, right? But if you can really um, tell a story about yourself that is individualized and obviously these secondaries you only have like 500 words or something like that right so you really have to find something concrete but um i would say take something very passionate um like we had i have reviewed some of the secondaries that come through rosalind franklin and we had um one guy um told us about his experience playing soccer and um, how playing with international people changed his perspective on all these things. And it was a very well received secondary and had nothing to do with uh, medical school. So I feel like it is a little bit of a risk sometimes and you feel very like hesitant to not talk about your love for medicine. But if there is a question that asks something of, and gives an opportunity to talk about yourself, I would definitely pick something that you feel most passionate about. To follow up on what Sal was saying there, um, I think passion really shines through. It's also like so much more fun to write about, of course, and that is obvious. I think also um, your secondaries are also a place where you can kind of control your own narrative. What do you want to talk about when it comes to they're getting the material, a lot of the questions they ask you. Um, so yeah, sort of this is think sort of ahead to this moment when I'm actually going to have to have a conversation with this. What is going to make my face light up, make the person really respond to me? It's going to be stuff I'm really passionate about, regardless of what it is. Yeah, just to add on to what you guys just said, I think what I remember someone telling me is um, when I was getting ready to apply is like a lot of times 
being a pre-med, you're constantly thinking about like, okay, what are the things the admissions committee is going to look for and how can I, and this is, you know, all throughout your undergraduate experience, like how can I kind of check these boxes? And to some extent, like that you have to do that. But I think when it comes to secondaries, I would really try not to fall into the trap of like thinking about what does the admissions committee want me to say? And instead, what Sal and Jessica were just saying, like, think about what is important to you as a person. This is the time where you can show the committee that how reflective and thoughtful you are and how through all of the experiences that they've seen on your primary application, you didn't just like participate in those experiences, but you've learned from them and you took something meaningful away from them. I think that's what's most important about secondaries. It's not reiterating what you've already put on your primary, but it's showing that you can how you derived meaning from those experiences, how they prepared you to be a good physician scientist, how they informed your goals for the future, things like that. Um, I think the first question was, um, what are some of the common questions that are on secondary? So there's like, I just kind of wanted to throw out some like topics that I noticed were um, in a lot of secondary. So one is talking about how you're going to bring diversity to that school. Um, and I would say, like, I know some people who are like, I am a straight white male from a very, like, you know, well-to-do family, like, I can't answer this, <laughs> um, which, you know, like, identity is a huge part of that, but also, like, there's people, ways you can be really creative with it, and so some people have written about, like, where they grew up, and, um, like, my one friend lived uh, in the border between their state's wealthiest county and poorest county. And they talked about like their experiences of like being around people with like varying socioeconomic statuses and how they kind of, how that shaped their, you know, worldview and like the experience of the people that they knew. Um, there's like ways you can, you know, think about what you bring that's going to be unique. Um, that's really the essence of that essay. Another one is talking about what you've done during your gap years, if you took them, that's a really common one. Um, how you handled adversity or how you're resilient or, you know, something along those lines. Um, and then I think there's maybe like strengths and weaknesses. Some schools have straight up just put on a question like, what's your biggest strength? What's your biggest weakness? Um, those are some of the ones that come to mind. I don't know if Sal and Jessica have other like prompts that they remember. You really hit them for me, actually. I'm just looking back at this Excel sheet that I made with all of the prompts um, because I wanted to see ones that were similar. So I would just kind of like go for those first because then it would take out like four essays that I had to do. Um, yeah, the resilience or like a challenge you went through, the diversity definitely. Also um, fit for the school is one that came up a couple of times, um, which wasn't always like my favorite one because a lot of the time the like mission statements are really similar for a lot of the schools. Like, I just want to like train at a place that's like obviously great and you're great and we could be great together. Um, that was, there was a question um, in the chat about um, like the most challenging secondary question. And sometimes I find, I found that a little bit difficult because it felt disingenuous to me because I could say the same thing to a lot of schools um, because they have a lot of really similar values. Um, but just to sort of address that question, this, I guess, is also an opportunity to go into the research side a little bit more, perhaps, and then also maybe looking at um, interesting student groups that they might have, um, or like advocacy opportunities, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, Megan, you like hit on pretty much everyone that I can remember, plus the what's your fit for the school one. Yeah, uh, definitely like what Jessica was saying. Um, one thing that I did it's not, I don't know if I recommend it, but I realized that I, so I had a big like um, uh, writing and arts background in my undergrad. And so what I would do is most schools have a uh, medical humanities club or some kind of medical humanities tie-in. So I would often bring that up um, as one of the um, factors that really interest me about the school because um, a lot of times there's not much to talk about because schools are so similar and at a certain point you're just like I'll go to any school that takes me uh, so I was like I actually would love to participate in that club if I went to that school so 
it was kind of like a cheat for me to like find whatever they had that was medically humanities or medical humanities, but it was still not a lot. I still would have enjoyed doing it. So if you can find something like that, if you can find some kind of research, um, those are just ways to kind of like, you're going to have to play a little bit of that game. And that's just part of the process. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for all of your insight. Um, I think every point that was mentioned was super helpful. Um, this next question is uh, somewhat kind of an offshoot, um, but people are wondering whether there are MD PhD specific questions on any of the secondaries that you received um, and kind of what did those questions entail? Um, and also, did you notice that like therefore your secondary application process was longer than maybe some of your friends who were applying MD only. Um, let's start with Jessica. Um, yeah, uh, so I was looking back at my secondaries um, just now. Some of them did have like pretty extensive MD PhD specific questions, some did not. I hate getting these kinds of answers in panels like well it depends um but yeah it really does but a lot of them um tended to be like questions about fit again or questions about specific people that you'd want to work with not binding or anything um but just showing that you've you know how to look and that this will be a good fit for you in terms of a lab not just the school um so yeah, it did make secondaries a little bit longer. Again, I was pretty lucky. I only applied to 13 schools, so secondaries weren't um, too out of control for me. Um, but completing these secondaries did take a fair bit more research, whereas for some of the other schools, I was just looking at like their um, sort of like their mission statement and um, like a broad overview of their curriculum. Um, then you have to delve a little bit more into specific labs and programs and things like that. Um, for these schools, which you're probably doing already because you want to see whether these are um, good spots for you. But uh, yeah, a little bit more work. Um, but if you're not completing 50 secondaries, I didn't, I didn't find it um, too burdensome. Yeah, um, there definitely totally agree with everything Jessica said. So I won't add too, too much, but yeah, there definitely are. Um, MD PhD specific questions on secondaries, not every school, but for those schools, I've had to, I think 16 schools and um, I would say like at least two thirds of them had um, one or two questions. Um, and yeah, I think that they are pretty much all related to research because the um, secondaries for the medical school kind of cover like the more clinical side of things. Um, not always, but for, for, the, for the most part. And yeah, with the research questions, that's a really great opportunity to kind of hit at that fit with the school. And so definitely take time to look into the graduate programs you're interested in and name faculty members that you're interested in working with. Um, that was some advice I had gotten before I applied and I'm really glad I did because in pretty much every interview that I had, you know, people were like, oh, I saw you're interested in this person's research. Even if I wasn't interviewing with that person, they might know that person. And then it kind of like opened up conversation, but it also just shows that like, you're really interested in that school. I mean, imagine from the admissions committee perspective, reading a secondary that's like very general, like, okay, I'm interested in this topic of study versus reading an essay that's like, I'm interested in this topic of study. And these are like five people at your school that are doing this work. And this is where I could see myself contributing to this work. Um, that's just a really great opportunity to like show how enthusiastic you are about that specific program. Because remember, they're reading, you know, potentially like thousands of applications. So, um, so yeah. And I think uh, kind of going off what Jessica was saying earlier about number of schools. Um, during this time that I was writing the MD PhD specific secondaries, I kind of had some like inner reflection of do I actually want to go to this school? Because then I was writing like. I am interested in this research and like there's this one person at the school that does it and I'm thinking like well what if my rotation with that person doesn't work out very well. Um, so yeah I think like throughout this process as you're doing secondaries definitely ask yourself like if this was the only school you got into would you go and can you achieve your research goals. 
at that institution. And that for me, I ended up not applying to actually 10 schools for a combination of that reason and then also kind of just running out of time and like submitting to the places I had most wanted to go to. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an opportunity to not only show you're enthusiastic about that school, but to kind of reflect on the process and like, you know, prioritizing what schools you want to submit to. Um, yeah, I mean, one of, not verbatim, of course, but a question was basically like, why do you want to be an MD, PhD? And it's a, you know, like, it's a tough question because it's, it's essentially writing a second personal statement. Um, but it's a fair question because it's like, well, you're going to invest uh, double the amount of time as a normal if you're trying to do um, MD PhD, you've got to do the PhD and then you've got to do a residency. So what's your plan for residency? What's your plan after residency? Um, it's a, an opportunity to kind of showcase what you've done and what you want to do. Um, it's tough because you're at one of those spots where you're like, well, you know, I haven't even been in medical school. How do I know what I want to do? You know, it's tough, but I took the idea of, um, I worked in a lab, um, I got in like my freshman year and I stayed in that lab and then did a gap year in that lab. And basically that's where I fell in love with research. So it was pretty easy for me to just be like, well, you know, I want to emulate this environment that kind of fostered this love for me. Um, you had to like make it personal, but that was, that was it. It was basically, why do you want to do it? Um, so while you're writing your medical school um, personal statement, you also kind of have to think of your MD, PhD personal statement, because I feel like if you write that, there's probably questions that you're going to be able to just kind of pull from that personal statement and just plug into an MD, PhD application. Awesome. Thanks for everyone's answers. Um, and so since we're about halfway through the webinar, I just wanted to um, give some reminders that the session will be recorded. Um, and Anna is diligently collecting everyone's questions um, and sending them my way. Um, and just as a reminder, you can submit in the chat box, um, our APSA Twitter or Anna's email, um, which is in the chat. Uh, so moving on to the next question, I think that um, a few of you have uh, touched on this, but uh, what strategies did you find to efficiently write your secondaries since you are applying to a large number of schools? Um, and is it possible to prepare all of your essays beforehand so they're ready to be submitted when they're requested? Um, and let's start with Megan for this. Yeah, so... For me personally, I guess I just want to take a moment to like anyone watching this who's writing secondaries right now, for me, it was the hardest part of the application process. I was really overwhelmed because it's just like a lot of essays and the primary, like you know for sure what they're going to ask you on the primary was the secondaries. Like there's a lot of schools actually use similar questions each year, um, but sometimes, you know, you never know when you're going to get that curveball. Um, so just keep going, you're doing great. Just wanted to throw some encouragement out there. You're gonna get through this and you're gonna get in. Um, but yeah, so in terms of strategies, um, I, I tried a couple things. So one thing was putting all of the essays I wrote in this Excel sheet. And I think Jessica said she has something similar. Um, and that way it's all in one document and you can like control F certain phrases. So for example, like, resiliency or you know if the question is about um overcoming adversity you can like quickly find things you've already written that are related to that um because in a lot of these secondaries they're going to ask something general like that and then I would suggest like giving an example or telling a story and then kind of like how you learn from that experience um and yeah in a way that connects to the prompt and you don't want to you know, look at each secondary like and start it from blank, like Word document. You definitely want to pull from things that you've been writing um, and just kind of add specifics to that, that school. And it definitely get, got easier with each secondary that I wrote. So that's one tip is um, 
uh, having like an Excel document with everything uh, in it. Um, and then the other thing I would say, I don't know how much this ties into efficiency, but um, I would, I kind of prioritize things based on what schools I was like most interested in, most excited about. So I got those secondaries out sooner. And then I had a few people that were willing to proofread things for me. And instead of just relying on like one person to proofread, so you're like waiting for them to send it back. If you're able to, if you have people in your life that are willing to like read it over for you, if you have like a couple people that way, that's a little bit more efficient. Um, you know, if you kind of send one person one document and one person the other. Um, that's kind of what first comes to mind. It's, it's definitely hard. It's a lot all at once. Um, but like I said, it definitely gets easier with each secondary because you're like more familiar with what stories you want to write about and like what questions to expect. Absolutely agree with all that. Do not reinvent the wheel for sure. Um, I, if I remember correctly there, I don't know if it's SDN, proceed with caution, um, but there are places where people will post what secondary questions were the um, year prior or a couple of years prior. And Megan did mention this, they tend to reuse them. So by the time I actually got my secondaries, I feel like I had already seen like 75% of the questions um, and that helped calm me down a little bit and know what was coming instead of thinking I'm going to get these questions and I need to turn around and you know send out some beautiful mini essays you know within a week I was sort of ready so that helped me um, looking online beforehand for prompts. Uh, yeah you guys have covered all of it it's a lot of copy and paste it's a grind I I would spend like, I remember there was one afternoon where I was like cleaning the lab and the manager came in and she was like, what are you doing here? I was like, I've got secondaries to write. I really don't want to do them. <laughs> so I was doing everything I could not to write my secondaries. Um, yeah, you just have to sit down and do it. Um, it's a lot of copy pasting and that's why it gets so challenging. Um, I guess, so we did have, is it okay if I just answer the one question by Anissa? Um, yeah, totally fine. Okay. So Anissa asked, when you apply to a PhD program during your MD cycle, is the completion time the same as an MD PhD program? Um, so I would say in some ways it might be faster um, because there's, I'm not the only person in my school that's done it this way, um, where basically we had interest coming into medical school and then we had either time during our M1 year or during the M1 summer, because we have kind of like the summer break before M2 year, and you get involved in a lab and you kind of fall in love with that lab, or at least you realize that you and the PI have an amazing like connection or like just the environment is working for you. Um, and so you actually like kind of have this head start and you get like a research project from the beginning, which is what happened with me. Um, and then when I joined the PhD, instead of like starting up a lab, I was actually already applying for grants using my, um, like preliminary results that I had, um, started like collecting during the first two years of med school. Um, I would have graduated the PhD in three years, but COVID hit and I wasn't able to get into the lab for a whole year. So, you know, that's like fine, but that would have been a three year PhD, uh, which is by most standards pretty quick. Um, I think four years is about average. Um, um, so yeah, I, it's definitely not gonna delay you. I would say the major drawback is that I still paid tuition for M1, M2 year. Um, once I got into the PhD and now during my M3 and M4 year, tuition is covered and I get a stipend from the school. So that's really the major downside of doing it when you apply during your M2 year is that some people might actually like give you retroactive, but probably not. Like once you've paid that money, that <laughs> they're not going to pay you back. Um, so uh, that's the major downside is that you have to pay for M1, M2 year, but Otherwise, I don't think the timeline changes at all. 
Great. And also, um, actually, Sal, while, while we're, we're on that topic, um, there was another question specifically for your experience. Um, so what was specifically involved in your application process? And did you have to write the same essays that someone applying directly into an MD PhD program would write? Uh, so I can't speak for like other schools, but basically I did the MD I got in that way, right? So I didn't have to do an MD PhD application. I just had to do, um, I guess it was. So basically, I answered two questions that were about why I wanted to be, uh, a, you know, a physician scientist, and then what was my research experience that would um, justify my desire to be a research, you know, a physician scientist, because. If you're if you've got like a summer or a semester of research and you're applying for this, you're not really going to be um, competitive as an applicant, I would say. Uh, a big part of it was the um, research experience that I had. And then when I got into the interview portion, I sat down with the dean of the uh, graduate school and he was like, OK tell me about your experience. Tell me why you think uh, you want to do this path, because um, from the graduate school standpoint, they get less out of us, us meaning MD, PhD students. They get less out of us than they do a standard graduate student, um, and they continue to pay for us at certain points. And that's going to, that's varying by school and all that stuff. But you have to really convince them that, um, you want to do this and it's not just a like free ride that you're seeking out um i if that answered the question yeah ho or hopefully yeah. whoever submitted that question found that helpful um okay so moving on to a more general question and um this applies to secondaries but um also just kind of every process of the the application cycle which is how do you sell yourself well without feeling like you're overstating your accomplishments? Um, and let's start with Megan for this. Wow, what a good question. <laughs> um, hmm. So, yeah, I think that I was constantly asking myself that question too. I just hated some questions. I just felt so like, yeah, not humble. Like, I, but at the same time, you know, you did do so much work to get to this point, and you want to communicate that to this admissions committee that has never met you, that's just reading your file. Um, I think it, it does take a balance. I think that one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say is, um, say you're trying to communicate that you were an awesome leader, and you were in all these clubs, and you, you know, just kind of found your way to these like leadership positions because that's just who you are, and you wanted to communicate that. I think a way to do that in a like humble way is to rely on stories rather than like factually stating the characteristic you're trying to get across. Um, humans are storytellers. There's a lot of like you know psychology research on this that we react you know, very differently to stories than to someone just like telling us something. Um, so I would say try to give specific examples as often as you can and then have like one or two sentences or maybe if it's like a longer secondary, like a paragraph reflecting on that experience. I think that is probably a good strategy to um, show that, you know, you're being like humble and thoughtful about your experiences while also, you know, communicating all the awesome things you've done to get to this point. That's the first thing that comes to mind for me. I really love that advice. I think like it's, you know, objective as opposed to subjective, letting the evidence speak for itself and not using like your own perceptions of yourself or, um, yeah, I totally relate to it feeling kind of gross to be like, I'm awesome. Um, <laughs> so yeah, telling stories, totally on board with that. Um, one thing, I don't know if this works for everybody, but this is something that I tried to make sure came across in my secondaries was also like my feeling of like gratitude for having the opportunities that led to me doing amazing things. Like it might've been like, yeah, I cold called someone and then I worked for free for a year. And then like, you know, this was like totally something that I did, you know, kind of myself, but 
there are still things to be like grateful for in there. I think people like to hear, um, they like to hear about people's gratitude for things too. So if you're able, I know like everyone has a really different path. Some people have more things to be grateful for than other things. But if you find yourself, you know, feeling like I'm just tooting my own horn too much, um, is there like a way that you can be like, I, you know, just expressing like, I am grateful I was able to have this opportunity or I'm, uh, I feel lucky I was able to grow in this way or what have you. I just thought of one more thing too. Yeah, that's such a good point, Jessica. Um, and it made me think like, don't forget that you have letters of recommendation that are in your file. And I, I think that some characteristics are best when they come from a letter writer. Um, and so like one thing related to that is if you think that like going with the leadership example again, if you think that one particular experience that you're, um, someone is writing like a letter of recommendation related to for you, if you think that during that experience you developed some strength um, with like leadership or you know research skills or something, you can communicate that to your letter writer. A lot of letter writers really want you to um, be very explicit with like what that letter is, like what the people reading the letter are looking for, um, what you hope them to communicate. So you could say something like, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to like work in your lab, for example. I feel like I learned how to be a leader through like X, Y, and Z while I was here. Um, if you agree with that, would you be willing to put that in the letter or something along those lines? Um, I think then you don't have to worry as much about like explicitly saying like all of the things you're worried might come across as braggy. And then you can use your secondaries to just focus on talking about things like your goals and that are a little bit easier to write about, like why you want to go to that particular school, everything we've said before. Yeah, um, I think even building off what Megan was saying, like there are opportunities to take what you gain from an experience and use that in your secondary. So you're not bragging about what you did. You're like, if you're the president of some organization, the skill that you got from that experience was something, right? So it's like, you're like, you're dropping your accomplishment or like, you know, like stating your accomplishment but you're using it as a something that's like making you better, making you, um, I don't know, something that, that's more enticing, you know, um, not just saying that you did it and you had like, you know, 50 members under your club name or something like that. Like that's more resume stuff. You know, what did you actually gain from the experience? I think that that's what helps. Yeah, I think that was all really helpful advice for kind of a tricky, a tricky thing to, to navigate. Um, so this is uh, kind of a um, more general, not really related to secondaries, but um, kind of more uh, of a personally directed question. So what are some unique non-traditional steps in your path before applying or deciding to apply to dual degree programs? Um, and let's start with Jessica. Uh, so I identify as non-traditional. So this is a great question <laughs> for me to jump on to. Um, I, so I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology in 2013. And I remember like the month after I graduated, I was like, oh, brains are kind of cool. Um, so I took a year to work and then I did a master's degree in neuropsychology, took another year to work. This was my failure essay, actually, where I just like could not get a job in research. I was like, what is wrong with me? Um, and I just decided to um, sort of pivot. And I taught English in Korea for a year. Um, and then after that, I moved to Australia and I worked in a neuroscience institute um, for a year while also working at a hospital. And then I went back to school, did like gen chem, biochem, all that jazz that I didn't do the first time around because of pre-med, uh, because I didn't do pre-med. And then I worked for a year in a lab <laughs> after two years of pre-med and I'm here. So really long-winded 2013 to 2021, essentially, I was kind of bopping all over the place. Um, that made it kind of challenging to um, primary and my to like pull out a thread that sort of 
prove some sort of like linear growth towards, I guess, the MD, PhD. My research experiences were really varied um, and my life experiences were really varied, which made that like sort of fun to talk about. But um, yeah, especially for the, from the research side of things, I found it really hard to be like, this is the research that I want to do because it's, but like what I've been doing, I did um, research in healthy like memory. I did um, memory and aging, like cognition and aging. Um, I did um, service delivery for young stroke survivors and I did spinal cord circuits and pain and oxytocin and mouse model. Um, so it was really difficult for me to um, sort of weave a thread through there. Um, it's still something that I struggle with now, like seeing all these like amazing accomplished people who've been in the same lab for years um, and I feel like I've kind of bopped around. Um, so why am I saying all this? It was hard to come up with, um, like to sort of communicate exactly how I had in a coherent way grown and learned and become prepared for an MD PhD. But every life experience, if you are a thoughtful enough person and you are reflective, has led to you know who you are now, um, and it's just a question of sort of like picking out some stories, like Megan was talking about, that can sort of like show how you've grown and the skills that you have gained. Um, you know, like I taught English in Korea, which it's sort of hard to um, translate into. You know, I'm going to be a great scientist, but I'm you know really good with uncertainty now and like pivoting really quickly and not having um, all information and still needing to perform um, just based on like the workplace that I was in there um, and also living in a place where I didn't speak the language. So um, having this sort of diverse path um, can make the secondaries a challenge, but I guarantee you they also like make you they, they do prepare you for whatever you want to do, you know, um, you've been learning along the way the whole, the whole time. So if anyone does have any specific questions um, about like how you sort of craft your secondaries and do pull out threads, I guess, that make them coherent and make a story because we are definitely um, animals that, you know, thrive on stories. Um, I could maybe give my email or we could... Do you think Jenny like do like an email pass through from like yeah. or something? Oh, I so usually we have all the panelists uh, put in their emails in the chat. Okay. Email. Um, but feel free to like do it whenever, whenever you. Okay. Yeah. Email. Sounds good. I'll do it at the end so all of our emails are in the same place. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I have talked a lot, so that's it for me. No, oh, no worries. That was um, really awesome to hear your story, um, Megan or Sal. Um, I can go. And there's also a, a question about um, how do you know you're ready for MD PhD and being first gen? Um, so I can kind of answer both of those um, kind of together here. So like uh, my, um, my dad and grandparents uh, came over from Italy, like when my dad was in his teens. And so my grandparents never really learned English. Uh, definitely didn't go to college. Um, so for me going to college, I didn't really have a um, kind of template and I had no clue what research was, like zero idea. So um, I got through my freshman year of school and I had the option of going home and working in my dad's business all summer long, which sounded miserable to me. So I actually found a restaurant job on campus and I stayed on uh, campus because I found like a really cheap apartment to sublet for the summer. And because I was working nights in the restaurant, I was like, well, let's find something to do during the day. And I found a research lab because I like figured out that, that was something you need for medical school. And then I just started spending more and more and more time in the lab. And I figured out that like I absolutely loved it. Um, so in terms of being ready for MD-PhD, I think you kind of know, you just like, it's just something you can't live without. Um, and I feel like it has to be that way because it's such a long path that um, if you kind of want to do reason, I, like you just gotta like feel like you love it um, because it's so tough. Uh, but 
Um, that being said, like I didn't have this um, programmed or set template and I kind of was figuring stuff out as I went. So I got a lot of help from um, people in the lab and uh, reaching out through organizations like this, where you just got in touch with people and they kind of um, helped you along the process. And so for me, especially since I didn't get into medical school the first time, I just tried to get into medical school and then just kept doing research because I liked it so much. And so I think there are ways to continue doing research if you really truly want to do it. And I think that's the most important part is that doors will open if you keep knocking on them. Um, they might not always open, but like if you keep going back and forth and trying to find new ones and new ways, um, that's really uh, the most important part is just like figuring out that you want to do it and finding a way to do it. Because um, even the path that I took doesn't really exist anymore because of curriculum changes and um, just ch like general evolution of school programs. So um, yeah, just if you don't have people that can show you the way, you're going to have to reach out and find them. Um, Twitter is an amazing thing as well for um, MD PhDs. Like even so like when I was in my PhD phase, our school doesn't have a super strong program. And so we don't have MD PhD grant templates, but a lot of other schools had them. So I was literally on Twitter looking up people that had their F30 grants funded and I would just like slide into their DMs and be like, hey, I saw that you got funded. <laughs> Do you mind sharing like any non research sensitive info? And like everyone was super receptive. Everyone wants to help each other out because it's a long, grueling path. And so any kind of assistance, if we are able to give it, it's 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 uh, it's helpful for us and it makes us feel good to help out, out people because there's not enough of us and we always want there to be more. So I'm trying not to shy anyone away from it. Yeah, those are awesome answers both of you guys um and yeah that's such a good point about twitter and i'm gonna remember that when i'm working on my f30 <laughs> um all i would add is um so yeah i mean my personal story i um had three years between when i graduated undergrad and um when i started um and actually similar to jessica my degree was in biochemistry and then towards the end of my senior year i got really interested in um how our brain responds to like sensory deprivation. So like, I'm really interested in hearing loss and kind of similar to Jessica, I was like, wow, brains are cool. <laughs> so I did um, a post back in a hearing uh, auditory neuroscience lab. Um, but actually before that I took my MCAT and I worked in a coffee shop and throughout undergrad, I um, worked for this nonprofit that was um, focused on uh, pro-social interventions and uh, as a way to prevent violence and so kind of like promoting the good and like compassionate acts in our society to prevent the bad um which is like very much it was very much uh geared towards like high schools and preventing school shootings and bullying and things like that so kind of unrelated to medicine but i ended up talking a lot about it in my applications and i guess the general takeaway um similar to what jessica already said if you have things on your in your story and like on your application that you think are non-traditional and like kind of weird, um, if that's an opportunity for you to be reflective, and most of the time people are really interested in those things and ask more about them than they do about the things you think are on the checklist of what you need to get into these programs, um, because they set you apart and they make you unique. So one piece of advice I got is like all of these things. Um, that I felt kind of self-conscious about and thought like, should I include this? I don't know. Um, one of my mentors said like, imagine you are reading that application and you're like so excited about that opportunity and like the way that that person reflected on that experience. And that shift, that kind of helped me overcome my imposter syndrome a little bit of like, instead of thinking about one particular experience as a reason why you might not get in and like something that people might question, kind of think, how would this make me a better doctor? Like, how can this actually, you know, be something unique that um, kind of informs how I treat patients in the future? Even if it is like teaching English in Korea, like I think what Jessica said about dealing with uncertainty and things like that, that's 
so important as both a physician and a scientist. Um, and it takes, you know, reflection to like lead the reader and the admissions committee through that process, but like that's so doable with a lot of like a very wide range of experiences. So try to like work through that mental shift on your own with your own experiences. And if you have questions, please email me. I'd love to like empower people to write about kind of more diverse experiences because I think like Sal said, we need more diverse physicians and physician scientists. We don't just need the same cookie cutter people with all the same experiences. Great. Thanks everyone for sharing, um, sharing your stories and experiences. It's, it was really great to hear. Um, so we're kind of nearing the, the end of our time here with this webinar. Um, and so briefly, I wanted to give each panelist an opportunity to just share like any brief tips or words for, you know, encouragement to people watching who, you know, are interested in applying or maybe are currently in the process and yeah, just, just anything you'd like to share in this, this last minute or so. Um, so let's start with Sal. Okay. I'm glad I'm going first because mine's going to be a little more cynical. So hopefully you guys, Jessica and Megan are still a little more optimistic. Um, the realities of doing an MD PhD are that it's eight years, most likely, maybe more. Um, and you're going to like fall in love with your classmates during your M1 and M2 year. And this is going to vary depending on school. But generally speaking, you're going to like be with your classmates M1 and M2 year. And then at some point, they're going to continue on with their lives. And then you're going to continue on, but you're going to go into the lab and you're going to have a great experience and you're going to like struggle and grow and do all these cool things in the lab. But then when you come back to medical school, everyone you knew and loved is gone. <laughs> and um, I say that because I'm going through it right now, but like, you know, I still have all of my best friends from medical school are uh, really close to me. And in all honesty, they're helping me through M3 year a ton. Like it's made it a lot easier for me, I think, because I kind of, they've kind of been like, all right, don't like, you know, do this, don't do that, all that stuff. Um, but the reality is, is that like, there's kind of things outside of the actual medical world that happen. Um, like your friends start to um, make more money than you. So like there becomes kind of tension, not tension, but it's like the reality is right. Like some of your other friends who are not in medicine, they're also starting to make money um, just because, you know, when you're outside of college for so many years, they start getting higher and higher positions. Um, people start having families. Um, or get married, you know, and that's not to say that you can't do that at all. Um, it's just that we all know that the life of a student is, um, it's challenging and it's hard to like kind of plan the rest of your life when you know that residency is always coming down the pipe and you don't know where you're going to end up and all this stuff. Um, and so these are just the realities. I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm just trying to tell you guys what I've experienced. And that, that's some of the those are some of the biggest hurdles is just those like the research and the medicine, you love it. And it's always like, it's almost easy to do it because you love it so much. And like, even though studying can be horrible, it's kind of fun in a certain way to like get this knowledge and like really be passionate about what you're doing. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in life. Um, and even after I say all that, you know, like timelines are flexible like what's the big deal it's only four more years a lot of people have separate careers where they spend three or four years in a job that they hate and then they go do something else with their life so like i'm just trying to give you guys perspective that like you know it's not just oh you do your mpg and everything's great and you always love your life all the time like you know there's there's valleys there's peaks and valleys and uh i think those are kind of things that i didn't necessarily hear when i was applying um and they're just things to kind of consider and um yeah i mean it's great it's a great time um and i do really feel um grateful that i like i'm in this opportunity and that i'm going to continue on doing it in, um into residency and when you get into your md phd programs apsa also hosts things about md phd residencies so 
the cycle never ends. You'll just be doing this again in four to eight years. Yes, so those are, it's really good to be aware of like the challenges that lie ahead, um, for sure. I'm glad that you shared that. Um, yeah, I guess so. Okay, trying to throw, sprinkle some optimism uh, in that. <laughs> Not that that was particularly, like that wasn't, that's just honest. Um, but yeah, one of the challenges with doing an MDPhD is you're not fully immersed in either world. You're you're just like half. You're you're split. You're standing on like two ledges, um, and that's hard and it's frustrating when you have friends who are fully immersed in each world and are like rocking it. Um, but something that I always remind myself, and I'm just starting, so I guess take what I say with a grain of salt. But there are questions in medicine and science that you being a physician scientist will be uniquely equipped to answer. Someone who's just a scientist or just a clinician won't be as equipped as you to answer those questions. And I would say during this application process, when things are really hard and you have like 20 secondaries in your inbox and you're working in the lab and you're like trying to still talk to your friends and family, just kind of remind yourself of that. Like think of those questions that you know, keep you up in my, at night and the questions that motivate you to pursue this path. And, and it really, it is rewarding having this, this perspective. Like eventually you're going to be one of the few people in the world, in your field, who not only have the scientific training to be able to do like rigorous work, to work towards solutions to clinical problems, but you're also in the clinic and you're working with patients, depending on if that's what split you want, which that can be a separate webinar of like different career paths when once you have an MD PhD. But yeah, just hold on to that fact that like this educational journey, though rigorous and frustrating at times, um, it equips you to have this very unique and very powerful skill set and perspective to work towards um, really important like societal uh, questions related to human health. So I hope that motivates you when you're I think this time last year I was working on secondary so sending lots of good writing energy to everyone watching this and yeah please email me if you have any questions or want me to read stuff or if I can help in any way I love to hear that stuff to like sort of have a reminder like yeah it's so motivating just to think about like all the stuff that we have to look forward to um but also like Sal said there are peaks and valleys I want to be a little bit more short-sighted and just talk about the year that comes for me, the application year was a valley for sure. I just felt bad about myself. I felt like I had put myself out there to be judged and I didn't um, relate to what I was getting back. I So just to be totally transparent, I had got two interviews and I got into one school pretty early and I was not interested in going to that school. I shouldn't have said secondaries like Megan was uh, talking about. And then um, I got into my first choice in April. So that was like six months of me just feeling like there was something wrong with me or that I had um, like misinterpreted how people responded to me or I just like didn't really know the type of person that I was. So I just wanna like call out now that this can be like a really difficult time um, and it's normal to feel imposter syndrome. Um, it's normal to feel kind of bad about yourself, but um, something that I think about a lot now and I hope you can like take to heart is that like everybody here can be exactly where I am like anyone here can do an amazing job as an MD PhD student as a physician scientist thereafter there are dozens of people who could have my spot and do just as good a job um one of the most like excellent students in our program applied multiple times like she just like had to like you know, just like crawl her way into a program. Now I can't imagine our program without her. Um, all this to say, like, try not to base your value on how these strangers evaluate you. You have value. You're gonna be amazing physician scientists, like guaranteed. Um, it may take an extra year, but you know, Sal was talking a little bit about like time. I know now a year can feel like a long time, but me being like so far out of school before I got, you know, sort of back into school, a year isn't, you know, it's not the end of the world. And because you have to take another year to get in and, you know, become the amazing, the amazing physician scientist that you're going to be, um, doesn't mean that you have less value than someone who takes one year to get in. Um, so yeah, stay strong and also sending out those good vibes for writing. 
thank you so much to all the panelists um, for all of your answers today. Um, I think that you provided a lot of really helpful advice and insight from your own personal stories as well. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us for this session today. Um, I want to thank. Um, Sorry about that. I want to thank um, our panelists for their time, the participants, um, the, the viewers who made the session interactive, and um, the apps of virtual content, JEDI, PR, and partnerships committees, um, Stephen, and apps leadership that not only put these sessions together, work to make sure that underrepresented in medicine applicants received word of it as well. Um, and we are currently in the process of planning our calendar for upcoming interactive sessions. So stay tuned via social media and look out for emails. Um, and yeah, thank you so much again to, to all the panelists and yeah, everyone has a, have a good evening or whatever time zone you're at. Thanks for having us. Good luck, everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.